Hello there. Happy St. Patrick's Day. I got my green on. I'm very proud uh, Irish today. And um, if we haven't met, my name is Julie Hirschberg. I am a neurologic physical therapist, the owner and founder of Reactive Therapy and Wellness. I'm in the Los Angeles area and I run a couple of clinics here. I also am a professor at USC teaching all of this fun stuff. And actually the topic today really is in line with a lot of what I teach at USC. So I was so excited uh, to get my hands on this article that just came out. Let me pull it up here for you. It's called Moving Beyond Movement, Diagnosing Functional Movement Disorder. <clears throat> um, this comes from the group. Um, I think both of these folks are in Toronto. They are Gabriella Gilmore, Sarah Lidstone, um, a really great group. I was able to see um, and meet Sarah Lidstone at the Functional Neurologic Disorder Society meeting in uh, last summer. And she did a really great presentation on integrated care for functional neurologic disorders. So this uh, really review, um, I guess you would say it was just published on the 9th of March. Um, really fantastic. So it's so good and so chock full. I think I'm going to break this up into a couple of segments. So today I want to talk about the diagnosis part. And um, we talk a lot about functional neurologic neurological disorder, and that's an umbrella term for many types of functional disorders. Uh, functional movement disorder being the most common. But here's the thing, and we see this a lot, and this is a big part of this paper, is that functional uh, movement disorder is not just a movement disorder. And they've got this great image so let me show this one. This is from the article. <clears throat> oh, it's kind of zoomed in so you don't see all of the words here, but I'll describe to you what, uh, what they talked about. Um, they uh, describe all of the non-motor parts of functional movement disorder. Now, by the way, this is not uncommon. In Parkinson's, which we know to be a movement disorder, there are loads of non-motor issues associated, autonomic issues, just like we see with functional movement disorders. Same thing in Parkinson's. So this is not unusual to have non-motor issues <clears throat> show up in this syndrome of a of a functional movement disorder. So some of the things that, that are kind of cut off on the sides here, uh, functional seizures, fatigue and sleep difficulty, headache, visual symptoms. So a lot of a lot of things, the head, neck, face, functional facial movements, swallowing dif difficulties, um, <clears throat> excuse me, linked up to the heart there, that's POTS, so postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. Um, so autonomic dysfunction can be a part of a functional movement disorder. So important because you, it, and what the authors talk about in this article as well, excuse me, I think I have to take a sip. <clears throat> is that this really truly takes a holistic examination. And while this article was written for neurologists and physicians, I'm really taking this and applying it to us as therapists. We should be taking this holistic examination as well and looking beyond just the movement symptoms. Some of the other things that are listed here, functional cognitive disorders, brain fog, this is the topic, by the way, this month in Brain Bite. So I'm, I'm super excited to see this here. Functional dizziness, um, post-concussion symptoms, facial pain, functional speech disorders, um, atypical chest pain, GI symptoms, uh, weakness, CRPS. All of this could be part of, a, this, of the functional movement disorder. So a really holistic exam is indicated and I think so, so important. So one of the other pieces that they bring up here, so I'm gonna grab another piece from, from this article, is talking about how we piece together, <clears throat> excuse me, the diagnosis exactly. So I really like, um, how they put together this, um, 
I know it looks like an equation. It's not really an equation, but taking the subjective part of the history and the person's story and even using self-reported scales here, um, that's kind of the beginning part of, of the formulation. I forget what the word is that they used here. Um, I'm going to pull it up. Pre-test probability. <clears throat> so looking at the, the, the zooming out to the whole person for a whole functional syndrome, their history, then adding in positive rule in signs. So we know that there are positive rule in signs, uh, such as the Hoover sign and trainability of tremor variability in uh, presentation, for example, but also rule out negative signs. So this is like the bread and butter of what I teach at USC is if you look at the nervous system as a whole, you're also going to do a neuro exam and look for cerebellar signs and uh, signs of basal ganglia dysfunction and upper and lower motor neuron signs. So those also become uh, rule out signs uh, as as negative findings. So you have these this pretest probability with the person's story, the functional syndrome and, and history, positive signs. You may have investigations. So these can include ruling out um, things and, and maybe doing electrophysiologic studies or MRI or not even requiring investigations. This is very common in clinical diagnoses. Um, and then putting that together with as a functional movement disorder. And what I really like here too, what you can see at the end, it says plus or minus other neurologic disorders because other neurologic disorders are common comorbid pieces of functional movement disorders. Um, so Parkinson's, MS, migraine, headache, all uh, could be really common comorbid conditions. Um, somebody asked the question, is there any brain scans you would order for functional tremor? Great question. Um, and no, um, and, and a very simple answer, no. And let me tell you why. So um, many types of tremors, so the most common tremor uh, in the world is essential tremor. Um, Parkinsonian tremor is, is another. Uh, we might also have physiologic tremor. Not, no, none of those types of tremor show up on a brain scan. Now, I will say there's a caveat for Parkinson's and Parkinsonism is that you could uh, see um, some changes on a DAT scan specific to those. Um, but but traditionally, MRI types of imaging are not indicated um, for tremor or for functional tremor. However, um, functional tremor is um, uh, very present on clinical exam and has a characteristic of entrainability. Um, meaning that it, you can train the rhythm of it. That's kind of where that train trainability comes from. Um, but I will say in the article, they do talk about, in addition, you could do neurophysiologic uh, testing. So um, there are some positive findings of functional tremor on neurophysiologic testing, and that is looking um, at surface EMG, for example. So that's where they would actually look at the muscle activity, and there are distinct findings on uh, functional tremor. So uh, we could go on and on on that. I, I find tremor um, to be really uh, fascinating and there's a lot to know and understand on functional tremor. Um, but that would be part of this investigation part of, of uh, the functional movement disorder diagnosis. Um, and then you have your diagnosis. So um, I like how they broke up these pieces. And you know what? Really emphasize the subjective examination. So I want to give an example of, um, of another another piece in this article that they provided is when you're listening to the story and putting together a timeline, this is again something um, 
I don't know if any of my students <laughs> come to these lives, but this may sound really familiar, right? We talk about the timeline a lot in um, neurologic disorders. It's a big part of the clinical diagnosis. And I actually have not seen it put out this way for functional movement disorders, and I thought it was brilliant. I'm gonna bring up the picture because I know it's kinda tiny here but they look at illness trajectory and comparing functional neurologic disorders to, to other uh, common neurologic disorders. So stroke is at the top where, boom, you have a stroke and, um, and then you, you have a static line. There, there's, there's not a worsening of symptoms um, after the stroke. And in fact, I might actually draw that stroke line down because of neuroplasticity and rehab that you can have decreasing disability over time. Um, and I think that's actually what they mean is if left untreated. Um, here, I just got a note that I froze. So hopefully we are, are back here. Um, let me point out the other line. So the orange line is a relapsing and remitting multiple sclerosis where you have distinct exacerbations and remissions. The yellow line is a neurodegenerative disease, something like Parkinson's. And then the blue line is a functional neurologic disorders, untreated. And so you actually see kind of this stepwise um, and and a pretty rapid increase in, in symptoms and then some up and down there. And I think very, very important, again, to point out this is if left untreated. Treatment decreases disability in functional neurologic disorders across the board, especially integrated treatment that focuses on the whole person. So uh, before we sign off here, I just want to bring us back to the whole person. Um, so um, this this whole person affected with functional movement disorders is why we need a whole person approach to treatment for functional movement disorders. One of the things that's actually on this that I forgot to mention, by the way, I think they put it maybe down at the at, at the joints, joint hypermobility. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, a very common um, comorbid condition with functional neurologic disorders, at least that we see. And I'm so glad that I, I, I see it here because it's like, yes, we see this all the time. It's um, not largely in the literature, so I was really happy to see this. Um, but this whole person, the motor and non-motor symptoms being affected in functional movement disorders means we need a whole person approach to treatment. And so um, if, if you're a person with a neurologic disorder, um, by the way, we're going to talk about some of that whole person approach to treatment in a free workshop we have next week. Uh, we're doing a workshop on autonomic, the autonomic nervous system, which is a big part of this whole person approach. It's next Tuesday. You can sign up on our website, reactivept.com slash workshops. Um, it'll be live, but we'll send out the recording to uh, if you're a healthcare provider and you love all things F and D, I hope you will join us in our Brain Bites community. We open our doors next month, and you can get on the waitlist at reactiveeducation.com. As always, I will send out. So let me pull up the article one more time. I will send out all of. Uh, the videos um, that I do all week, these article links. Um, I'll send that all out to our newsletter. Uh, we've got two of them. So if you're a healthcare professional, reactiveeducation.com, sign up. We'll send out that newsletter today. If you are a patient, reactivept.com, and we'll send out a newsletter on Monday with, with these pieces specifically to you. Um, <clears throat> So thank you so much for joining me on a Friday. By the way, I did a live yesterday. It was awesome. And it was like too, uh, Instagram wouldn't take it. It was too long or too big or something. So I did upload it to YouTube. I posted a link. I'll send that out in our newsletter, but it was great. I was able to answer a therapist SOS email about functional gait disorder. And I thought it was really great. We had a lot of great questions. So you can grab that on our newsletter too. Um, in the meantime, have a wonderful rest of your Friday, a great weekend, and I will catch you next week. Thanks so much.